This is smithy.tv. Holy smokes, we have Zach Bennett here. This is Cast This. I'm James Scott. I'm Ryan Goldhar. And hey, you are. Yeah, and I'm Zach. Zachary Bennett. Zachary Bennett yeah. of the Bennett Dynasty. <laughs> yes. So many Bennett's, so little time. There's too many. That's why we have just one here this, like, today. I'm the good. ambassador for Crazy Town. Yeah. How are you, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Good, yeah. good, good. How are you doing, Ryan? You're way over there. I'm terrific, and, and, and uh, I'm playing with my, my keyboard here. And my yeah, are you going to be playing like, video games while we're doing this? or? No, I, I've given up that part of my life now. Have you? Yeah, children do that. And once you have children, uh, if, you, if you're a responsible adult... Uh, you absolutely have no time or awaking hours to play. Well, I always thought it was it was masturbation or games. Like you can't. Well, I chose like I chose that, masturbation. You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because you get into the bathroom and, and, and you James, lock that I mean, door. Come on. It's, it's like, funny. I don't have a kid, and I still chose that. Do you still lock the door to masturbate? Like you go into the bathroom. Like, you don't even have a kid anymore. Well, I like to add an element of, of risk. I just wait until my wife is sleeping at that point. <laughs> You know, Sometimes I don't wait. <laughs> you don't wait till she's asleep. No. no. Oh, it's like that awkward scene in uh, American. That's Beauty. exactly what. Oh. It is. Just don't look over here. You know, like what you see. <laughs> just trying to get this ring off my finger. That's all you're seeing. I'm just trying not to cut my. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! I can't believe yeah. I'm speaking this bitterly about marriage. I just got married. Yeah, you just got married. Hey, congratulations! Mm -hmm. and welcome to the uh, the fold of rings. And thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it's bliss. Oh, uh, we're sponsored today. We're sponsored. <laughs> Wish, wishful thinking. Uh, oh, shit, we're sponsored yeah. by Starbucks. I think if we just say that we are, then we are. Yeah. And sure. then, uh, are you on? You're on camera as well, holding up. There we are. And uh, yeah, let's do the two shot. Aim at that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. I can't wait to watch that and see what that looked like. <laughs> uh, Zach, we yes. we have this podcast to talk about, uh, you know, the business and of acting and show business. You've been in this business for longer than I've been alive. I think, <laughs> uh, and that's a long time. Seeing how he's younger than you, it's I know that's so weird. <laughs> but I think you actually weren't you playing uh, babies in wombs before you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the first thing I ever did. He was a zygote. It was. It was a French <laughs> zygote performer. Oh, it was horrible. You had a lot of range. Uh, I did actually a French Rice Krispies commercial with my sister Marin. That was my first acting job, and I was. I'm pretty sure I was five. Uh, five or six, yeah. So okay. That was, I think five though. Uh, who was in the who was in the acting racket before you and your family? Oh man, there were a lot of people. Like it's been going on for centuries. <laughs> yeah, like some um, work with I mean, Sarah William Bernhardt. Shakespeare's, uh, what? Some worked with Sarah Bernhardt back it's, in the. It's amazing. Um, basically, my my mom wanted to get into acting, so we moved here from London, Ontario. Uh, and my father became a, he, he got his teaching degree and he got a job in Stouffville, Ontario. So we moved to, to Toronto and uh, kind of the agent who took on my mom was like, well, would you, your kids be interested? And we were just, you know, very dramatic things anyway. So why not? It just so, worked out. Yeah. And very quickly we started working uh, a lot. So that's kind of how it. So, what was your first dramatic? Um... Oh, that Rice Krispies commercial. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that had a full narrative. Well, it was in everything. French, right? So oh, I had, yeah. I had, they, had, they said "creek crack crock" at me, and I, I was fighting words, man. I don't, come at me, bro! <laughs> I would yell. Um, my first that's dramatic career in UDA was. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot of the uh, classic uh, series around town. Uh, the day uh, Diamonds was a big one. Whoa. Um, and uh, there was the uh, the original ER emergency room. I was on that. A lot of cats and dog. That was another 
classic. Wow, anything that's in Showcase Limbo right now. Yeah, is, pretty much. You I, I, you'll find me. I'm like. Did you do a Littlest Hobo, or is that before? I didn't do a, no. I was a bit before me. I didn't do Littlest Hobo. I didn't do the Campbells. Uh, Night Heat. Anything like <laughs> the, that? Night Heat. I didn't do the Campbells. I, yes. I did a Friday the Thirteenth series. In fact, I was on. I was doing shooting that episode, which was directed by David Morse. Uh, he directs once in a while, I guess. And then uh, my sister was born when I was on set. Oh. So I actually got a call from my agent like in the studio shooting. It was like covered in bodies. Zach, you got a call. And that was like the birth of my sister Sophie. It's oh, it's cool. Yeah, so I've been working for a while. Uh, but my first, I think my first real dramatic role would probably be Looking for Miracles, I guess. I mean, I did a bunch of episodic before that, but Looking for Miracles was the first of my connection to Kevin Sullivan. So that was, it was a feature film he did, a summer camp movie starring Greg Spottiswood and myself. Uh, Greg, who recently... Who Greg oh, you were, a, you were a lead in it, even? Yeah, yeah, we both got nominated for Daytime Emmys. So that was... Wow! Yeah, that was exciting. LeVar Burton was the host. It was... With or without the eye... <laughs> with or without the visor. That's the kind visor. of what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the banana clip. Yeah, like, that's it, the banana clip, yeah. I think I was like eight or nine years old, and I think I just wanted... Or maybe I was a bit old, maybe 11, whatever... Well, uh, what's it called? Total Recall, the original, was in the theater, so whatever year that was. Wow. Uh, and yeah, it was in L.A. It was interesting. In LeVar Burton, I was like, oh, man, I wonder if he has that. Yeah. I wonder if he just throws that on whenever anyone questions if he is Jordy LaForge. <laughs> <laughs> or the guy from Reading Rainbow. Yeah, that's how I knew him. Because that was shit. before... Uh, that's when you could see his eyes. That's when, like, most hosts of children's show were really kind of, like... To me, looking at them now, they're they're very gay men, all of them. Like, like it seems. Well, or just very kind of uh, either androgynous uh, in, in presentation, or just really effeminate. Like, Mr. Rogers... Well, I thought, yeah, he he, he gave he my gaydar went off with Mr. Rogers. Yeah, I don't too. think he was gay though, was he? Anyone? No, I don't think he was gay. Did you, did you feel that way about Mr. Dress Up too? I mean, no, Curry Coons, no, not at all. No, no, exactly. I mean, that's just, I didn't say they all were. He was more. He was more like you're the dad you wanted to have, or an uncle that didn't do bad things to you. <laughs> There's so few and far between. Right? <laughs> oh, goodness. So that you got the so did you did you audition for the role in uh, Looking for Miracles? Yeah, and then yeah. I, that's when I met Kevin Sullivan. And then uh, was the, your next project the series? Or? No, the next project was uh, Lantern Hill, which is another film by Kevin Sullivan, uh, another Lucy Montgomery thing, and uh, my sister Marin starred in that. And I had like a little, just a little small part with my actual real life brother Gareth. So all three <laughs> Bennett siblings were in that film. Wow. And uh, that was a good, yeah, that was a good time. It was, it was fun. And then around that time was when uh, Road Davenly started up. Did you have to audition for that or did he just give it to you? Um, I don't know if he, like, I was in all the screen tests. So that was the only time in my career where I was actually in the room working with other actors. So I kind of think I was, because of those films, was already, yeah, this this kid, I know where he can go. He'll be perfect as, mm-hmm. as that. But I, he can wear vests. He can wear vests. He can, wear he can articulate. Yes. And 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 that shit eating grin will sell for a couple more years at least. <laughs> so let's see if he can do that. But yeah, so that was I, that was like my crazy like I worked all and then from that it was like I only just went for seven seasons. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so many people watch that show growing up. You were part of so many people's childhood. Childhood. You know what? You were the, part of your own childhood. It, the craziest thing about that show is to this day like. Excuse me, if I have like a beard, like a full beard, uh, people will stop and go, were you Felix? And I wonder like, I look like Grizzly Adams. Like, but that's what he would have looked yet. like later on. I, we should do Your Felix eyes, in the later years and like the whole, everything the whole town burned down and I'm all like some Cormac McCarthy novel where I'm covered in soot and hang chugging uh, <laughs> like elixirs and things. Yeah, <laughs> I think it'd be great. Yeah, that would be good. It'd just be me and uh, and Sam Sam Neil, I think. Like she's in, or Sam Elliott, he'd be better. Yo, he'd be great. You guys could have facial hair and accents. I was gonna <laughs> say if you're, exactly. if you're gonna go for like you know like a full like sort of look, then he he sports that thing better than than anybody. Yeah, yeah. and he has that talk. 
Yeah, that's what that taught. Well, you get the draw of Jeff Bridges, too, I suppose. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you did that for seven seasons. Yeah. Did you feel, um, like, ab- abused as a child actor by the by that process, or did you really enjoy it? Because I, I know it was hard on... It's hard being a child actor in... in Shows. What's really hard about being a child actor is it's so adorable to the outside world that no one questions of it. It's kind of. I got really pissed off when that dog that um, was in the car with the the hood on. No, it wasn't a dog. The monkey. Sorry, the monkey. Yeah, yeah, the uh, IKEA monkey. The IKEA monkey. Because that's where I went. Um, hold on. I know it looks cute and adorable, but that's a freezing cold animal in locked in a cage in a parking lot that is and, scared out of its wits. And trust me, yeah. I've kind of been there. So, <laughs> I mean, being a child actor. In is the many of being a trap no, monkey in a cage. I know, that's fun. <laughs> you guys have just like cornered me with this now. Uh, no, being a, being a child actor. This is the in the news tour. Yeah, exactly. The National Post is running with this. Yeah. And the, and the sun's just going to have a big stamp on my face and fucked. Over it. Just, there it is. Yeah, they can write that th- now. You know, the funny, that you joked best. earlier about the epic band thing, and yet now it's all I feel like. I'm yeah, you're doing it. I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing. Fucked. God. You're screwed. <laughs> oh, God, Fuck me. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> we just hear him. We'll just hear him swearing time. and laughing in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great way to talk about a child. It is, it is. It, and, uh, yet, and yet, basically, it has no content thus far. No, no so. it, it really, it wasn't. A, uh, child actors are like, in, in one respect, w- my childhood was amazing, and I was treated like a, a like a prince. You know, I mean, it was great. Um, that you know, there were sacrifices that had to be made. I, I you know, I, I ended up dropping out of uh, high school uh, because by the time I finished Road to Avonlea, I I just had no time for schoolwork. So by the time I was finished, I I would have had to start high school again uh, just to catch up and understand what was going on. Um, so it, there are, you know, pros and cons to it. I think there are, I think a kid can be an actor and, and have a healthy uh, career if they have the right support support system around them. So yeah. they have parents who uh, don't get, um, like, deer in the headlights kind of, well, or don't get the money, money symbols in their <laughs> eyes and go, holy shit, yeah, yeah, keep acting, oh, yeah, it's great. But... Uh, I, I, you know, so me growing up on set was an amazing experience in many ways. It, it ta- I, I just asked so many questions. Like for me, being on a film set was like, I, I can see kind of certain kids being like, okay, I get in front of these bright lights and I say this, okay, cool. But for me, I was like, what? are those bright lights all the same? No, they're not. Let's go talk about them. And I'd learn, you know, different different things about the lighting department or, or you know. And so I'd, I'd ask all these questions and then I'd learn about a frame and I'd learn why why we get medium shots and why we go over the shoulder and how we don't cross the axis and things like that and I started That's getting, cool. so I got a real career in, in what I absolutely in one of the mediums I love to express myself in so that's pretty cool um, do you feel though uh, looking back like do you feel like an educated person in, in the world like with the way that other people do who went who finished high school and all that stuff yeah I think so like, and did it, you do a lot of reading on your own and just all that kind of thing for just for your own interest well, or, yeah I mean three letter words is pretty much as far as I go so but you, you, I but you usually books exactly that have those right cardboard pages so you can get them yeah. with both hands <laughs> Uh, that's fine. I, I, I find it Do keeps you like my... Do you like that have foam in the middle so you can hold them out at the same time, interact with your book? That's a th- I get a little anxious about that because then I have to figure out where they go at the end of the... You know, what I actually like is the Caterpillar book where I can actually get my finger through the entire novel. Where, uh, I feel a real sense of accomplishment. As opposed to like where you, you take out a pig... Or maybe I just like to fuck everything. What? And you take out a pig and you think that it has to go into the lamb shape. See that? And then, and then I start getting issues. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great book for vegans. Damn it. Uh, no, no, yeah. So I, I, I yeah, I, I, I consider myself to be uh, thoroughly educated in the way of being able to do what I do. <laughs> so That's good. If I step one step outside of this industry, just a car will run me over, and that'll be it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I got that kind of like hard knocks experience, hands on experience that I'm sure a lot of aspiring actors and directors would would love to have mm-hmm. um, and I was able to kind of 
see see the different kind of guidelines as per how to act or just how to walk into a frame that's for television versus if we're doing something more panoramic and where you know where the center frame may may lie and things like that so yeah seven years on that show yeah uh when that was finished did you continue was your career did it continue because how old were you when that uh finished I was uh, I was about 15 years old when it finished, 15, 16, and it was really tough because when I came off that, it was just here, here there is Felix, you know. So, um, and and the funny thing is, I had hit it quite a growth spurt at that time. So I was 15, and I looked like 18, 19, but it was really actually kind of hard for a lot of people to see past what I like the peak of the show, which was when I was about 12. Mm -hmm. So people would say, oh no, it's actually way too young for that. It's like, well, you should really see him. And, you know, it was harder back then, you know, without the interweb yeah. to convince people. So it took quite a while to uh, to kind of step up to the plate. I, I mean, in many ways, I don't think I ever did. It was like, I, I never quite got past that that Felix thing in this country. But but at the same time, I've, I've been able to sustain my career enough. Uh, but I, yeah, I had to kind of earn the yeah, was there, a big, is, was there a big, uh, was there a dry spell after that show, or did you keep... Yeah, I'd say there was a dry spell. I mean, it was it was more like, I, I definitely did not work as consistently as I did when I was the lead on the series, absolutely. Yeah. But it wasn't that I was, I was never out of work for very long. I, I did a lot of voice work right away. Oh, great. So that was kind of the beginning of my voice career. I, started, I did the voice of Jesse and Free Willy, the cartoon, and that was my... That was my, and the whale talked in the cartoon, which I think if the film took that approach, it might still be around to this day. I think it would. I mean, every generation the needs alone. a. Like, just think. I mean, well, every, every would be going. Every like, generation needs. A, <laughs> <laughs> every generation needs a Francis the Talking <laughs> Mule. <laughs> exactly. Do, so, do you change yeah. over from an orca? Like you switch it up, maybe? It's like it's, like he's no longer he's no longer of that variety. Now they do the humpback. And then they, I think the humpback is just like the wise man. It's like a Tolkien whale. Yeah, and then they really switch really it off. Maybe they go for a blue whale for one one. They go for the world's largest. Oh, I think they should do a blue whale, and then you just people just go in there, and the whole show takes place inside that. I, I fucking love. They call that Pinocchio. Like, oh, I love how like <laughs> we, 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 we veer whenever yeah. you, whenever you pipe up, like conversation goes so far away. From, what it <laughs> from where it was, We're both not geographically <laughs> and I'm like, and logically. <laughs> I, 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 I apologize. It. My brain works. I love how in you a brain. whole other. You are the graphic novel of this. Well, I was panel. thinking to myself, and, I, and this <laughs> this actually involves your your voice work too, because I I'm now listening to you all the time. Yeah. With Wild Kratts. Oh, my, son's obsessed, credits, yeah. my son's obsessed with it, and and before I even read the credits, I knew you were on that. I, I just I know your voice well enough, so it's just like you can hear. It's, <laughs> what, what is it? What is that? I'll take, it, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, the Crap Brothers uh, are these guys who did this animal show. This uh, Zabumafu was their big like. I don't kids think these shows are aimed shows. at me. And that's no, <laughs> no, you were, you were too much. <laughs> was mixed with puppetry, right? Hey, yeah, puppetry, and, and anyway, so they started this cartoon which is them in real life at the beginning like the crab brothers let's go to learn about this new it's and Mark and Chris, right yeah 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 and uh, and then they you know they'll find out like let's learn about the platypus and how the platypus survives and then they'll go into the cartoon where like I play two of the villains on the show try to steal a platypus to make like so one of my characters is gourmand who is like a uh, a chef who uses he wants wild, to eat like, you know, like random wild. He wants to animals. like eat endangered species and yeah. cook roots. So he talks like this, and he goes over there, and he goes, "Oh, look at you! You're great!" And uh, the, the thing I love about the voice work is like you can go so fucking over the top, and it, people love it. Or you know, as an actor, you learn that's not how it goes. Uh, but then the other character I went was basically his name is Zach. Zach Varmatek. He's the villain. And he's, he's kind of just like Gilbert Gottfried in the way he talks. And he just screams everything. And so these are the two guys I get to be on this, nice. on this show. And yeah, it's so much fun. Like, voice work is is, is the best in many ways. Like, well, uh, you can show up in track pants and be good to go, right? Yeah, there is that. There's that. Like, someone just posted a clip of uh, Mr. Uh, what was it? Krusty the Clown coming in to do the Krusty doll. And he comes in with a cigar and cue cards and just... 
whips them all off. Just, hey, hey, it's Krusty. Hey, hey, let's do this. And he walks off. And then the guy's like, okay, Krusty, we're ready to record. But he's already gone. <laughs> classic. Classic. Um, there, are, there are a couple people who, who love that kind of lifestyle. But mostly it's a, an incredible community of actors who are outstandingly hilarious. I mean, the, um, I do a... I, Almost every show I do, uh, Sean Cullen is in as well. And, and just, to, just to listen to this guy, because he's kind of loud, you sit in the waiting room and you hear him in, in the studio, and he's just so much fun to listen to. He just, he just throws himself into his work, so it's cool. I love voice work. Voice work has kind of like saved my life. I think I wouldn't be able to uh, sustain a career as an actor in Canada without... Like, I, there are very few actors I know who just act. Mm. Uh, you have to find some sort of other income Yeah, uh, that's a bit more reliable. And voice work for me has been just a godsend. So, yeah. yeah that's how I've, so. have, have you done a tour of duty in Los Angeles? I have not. I never went. I plan, I mean, I've been to LA a couple of times. I went... Well, took for the daytime Emmy Awards. I went for the daytime Emmy Awards. <laughs> and I went, and I tried, when I was about 15, I stayed with a friend, uh, Graham Lynch, who's a director. Uh, he, he lived out there for many years, and he said, if you want to come check out the city, let me show you around. And he, he played host to me for about two weeks when I was about 15 years old. I hung out with all, all the, uh, what's that show, the Madison. Remember Madison? The, uh, the show. Yeah, yeah. That's all the Madison kids, like John Scarf. All those, all those kids again. Remember all of them right now, but and uh, and then I, I kept thinking about going. In fact, I, even up until recently, I was thinking about well, maybe I'll go down for pilot season and just do it. Like it's every, you know, it's a rite of passage or something. Um, and then I kind of stopped and looked at myself as I'm like almost walking out the door and see myself in the mirror and go, oh shit, I'm ten years older. Oh, I don't want to do pilot season anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's not. Wait a minute, like. That's when those those twenty two year olds yeah. you know, crack eggs on their freaking abs, and I'm, that's cool. You guys go do that all. I'll hide over here, thanks. But yeah, so I've never been. Um, my brother and sister in law live in Los Angeles. I spent lots of time there. I would totally like work there. It's great. Like it's a great town. But no, I've never done that pilot season or move down to test my to test my luck. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, sometimes I wonder what if. Um, about that decision not to do that, not to chase that dream in that way, but in doing so, I've 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 managed to sustain a pretty, I think, solid career in Canada, and I think that's it can be very difficult to do. So I, I kind of I'm quite proudly Canadian in that way. So it'd be hard for me to try for the bigger, but you know, the the bigger lottery jackpot up there. <laughs> But uh, also, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to get interested in, I'm, I've made my first short film and I'm starting to get into kind of directing and stuff. And so I, I think being in Canada kind of use the community you know. And yeah, yeah. What, what is the short film you did? I, did, I shot uh, an eight minute film uh, I wrote and directed called uh, Where Do We Go From Here? And it stars uh, my real life sister, Sophie Bennett and Atticus Mitchell and uh, the lovely Nadia Litz. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, yeah, it was... How, uh, how long ago did you shoot that? It was last... Uh, March? Yeah, it was, yeah. it was within the last half year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's new. And if, uh, oh, is it, have you been putting it in some festivals? Or yeah, well, we've been applying. We haven't gotten into anything yet. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> it's the best feeling in the world. It's the, it's, you know what? I love, I love the feeling. You know that feeling. I gotta say this well, though. With, <laughs> with a short film though, it's kind of like, well, fuck you, I like it. And it's kind of cool. Like, if I haven't felt that rejection feeling about a short film, like, right. I'm kind of like, that's eight minutes that I fucking did, and it, it's awesome, so fuck you. Like, yeah, that's kind of, yeah. and I don't need, like, the validation of, we'll put it in and show it to audiences. I mean, like, if it was a 90 minute film, I pray to God it, it gets into these festivals. But short films are, yeah, I couldn't imagine with the, uh, me myself at home. Oh, at home by myself with yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like that was that was a whole other ballpark. And you know, we got into some. Like yeah. we were definitely in festivals, and we traveled, and we went to Vancouver. And we all premiered in Vancouver. That's great. But I mean, you think the story behind something like you've got Gordon Pinson, and you've got Kristen Booth, you got these great Canadian talents uh, in the film. The budget was forty three thousand dollars shooting. I'm not. 
you know, obviously we don't, you know, we're not including, you know, the closing finances and all that, but then you, you've got a great story behind this, you know, at a time before Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Yeah, it was fantastic, right? yeah. So you're not asking, the, you're not crowdfunding. You are in a way, it's, it's the origin of crowdfunding when you put a jar of change somewhere around the city and you have it, to. It's more grassroots. It's, it is grassroots, yeah. but we got made. And you know the quality is is definitely worth more than what it looks what we actually paid for it. Mm -hmm. And you thought you know maybe this gets into TIFF maybe the you know it was like last year they put in the most expensive Canadian film now let's put it in the least expensive Canadian film and that didn't happen. Well, you know what I think it is, especially with the festivals and the, well, the industry in general. I was just talking about this uh, with my friend Dave. Was the, the there's the baby boomer generation. And then there's the leak over through the kids. And it's, it's not, I, I don't want to slam that generation in any way, but it's kind of like this, this generation of entitlement yep. is slowly leaving the industry. And what's coming in is very exciting. And that is young people who want to make art together. And we haven't seen this in a while where the greed is not really part of it. Yeah. The level of, of collaboration at this stage it's is, is as outstanding. Yeah, yeah. Totally. yeah. So like what Jeremy's doing and, and things like that, it's, it's so inspiring. And I think you guys, like, I commend you for doing that because what you actually, what, what I got from, from that statement of that jar was actually a bit, bro was a bit uh, stronger <laughs> message, which was, um, yeah, this is how we can do it now, motherfucker. Yeah. The game's changed. It can be made for a jar of change. Yeah. We can make films on our cameras. Don't you get it? Mm -hmm. Like, we don't need you. We can and do so them on our phones. Exactly. So now, like, with, and with Ingrid Venager's 1K Wave last year in Toronto, and yeah. she did that, like, you know, make a film for $1,000, and there's a bunch of different things like this happening right now. I actually think that we're... We're on the cusp of a great change in this industry, and I, I, I really feel like... Like that kind of attitude is actually now the norm because of Kickstarter, because of the internet. I, I think that these festivals are kind of relics right now. They're behaving as though they're being kind well. Of silly. I mean, the, the festivals still live and breathe on the dime of the of the studio system. Exactly. I mean, they're the ones yeah. who are you know giving a little bit of extra cash to sort of say I'm not uh, insinuating anything. It's just that it's just a, a it's reality. The politics it's a, of film of the industry, yeah. and, and you need to push your stars. And well, yeah, and it's also a celebrity look look and see who's yeah. here sort of thing. As but well. I think something else is going to start because that's how. Like it's just like get when yeah. you bring in stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, but that, I think that it's, it's as our that systems get built uh, when communities embrace someone, and that's what it's funny we went right over to this, but it's true. And we don't English-speaking Canadians do not embrace themselves in this in, like each other in their own industry. And I think once that begins, I think then we're starting to get somewhere. Yeah, I think then we'll actually get the respect of uh, like the total like. Equality and respect of each other, uh, where we can look over to our, our French filmmakers and actually like collaborate a bit more. I'm quite shocked that this incredible country we have of outstanding fucking artists are completely divided by a language barrier. It's like it's a yeah. little, you know, it's what? Bring it over. Like, let's fuck around. Like, let's what I find jam, you know? is even with the French filmmakers, I mean, they, they incorporate English into their films and use it to their best ability because yeah. they can, but they still don't involve our side of the border. So to speak, outside of Quebec, and then then because I mean, obviously there are terrific English-speaking performers in Quebec, so you're not yeah. you're not losing out on the Montreal crowd. No, but that collaboration, that nationwide collaboration with the French, doesn't exist. Why would we share with you if you don't want your own shit? That's right. That's like the bottom line, right? Yeah. And and that's like, I'm, and I'm so fascinated by it because we all get together and we all talk about everything with such passion. Yet <laughs> it's not really, uh, okay. you know. I mean, we're talking. I mean, look at. I mean, Road to Avonlea is still the one thing I'm, 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 I, I grow more and more respectful of with, with that whole thing is, is how much people carry that. Like, that was a long time ago. But there's still, like, diehard fans. Like, I have a website all about, you know, me and, and what I do based on, you know, that character I did. Mm -hmm. And that started this whole kind of fan base thing. So. I, I used to kind of run screaming from it, like I was like that rebellious well, but teenager. The, the, Kevin Sullivan was smart enough to pick up on like something that is English language uh, and Canadian that English language speaking people will watch because it's great for the whole family and kids and all that sort of stuff. And and it was done well. Yeah. You know? So that's another thing that like in this day and age, like people are re. Everyone's embracing 
uh, television to be more like film now, which is great. But like then it was very there were very strict guidelines in order to operate and that was like I think they did all right with that yeah yeah well that's boring as hell so come on <laughs> I'm James Scott listen <laughs> you're trying to wrap out of this I was actually if I had to kill another <laughs> fucking animal on that I just show. thought that was a great ending but uh, keep going. <laughs> keep well going. there's a whole other aspect of this man we haven't even talked about <laughs> Should we do episode two then? I'm a Swiss Army knife. Of well, well, I, mean, I, 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 I want to bring something up because it's also something that he's very passionate about, and and we were just talking about this at the beginning when I was slating all this stuff. It was like Tin Star Orphan. Yeah. Zach is also a, a musician and, and a performer mm-hmm. off off the camera, and and let's. I mean, what what prompted this? Like, what brought you to? To you know, how do you start playing that guitar there? Like, yeah, 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 you pick up yeah. something, and then what? What drove you, drove you to you know that to songwriting? To songwriting, and to it's orphans. In case to start orphans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. I was worried that the tag was going to be put incorrectly. <laughs> it might be. Let's yeah. see. It is. It's correct. Yes. I, I pluralized I it. You do it. <laughs> I just um, put it the music has been like. Uh, I'm very connected to music. I always have been. I grew up. Uh, my middle name's Donovan. There you go. You know, like uh, they call you Mellow Yellow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I've grown up with a, a very passionate. I mean, my, my parents have a very eclectic and passionate taste of like Lindsey Buckingham and, and Kate Bush and and all these and you know like obviously the Beatles and, and the Kinks were a big deal and stuff like that. And then as I got into my teenage years, yeah, I went, like, nuts, like, on music, and it was, you know, the Smashing Pumpkins, excuse me, all that, and, uh, so I bought, like, a, a Telecaster for myself, or I got one for Christmas or something, and I tried to, like, you know, buy distortion pedals as many as I could buy to just, and never, never learned how to play the damn guitar, uh, and it wasn't until I got my heart broken, when I was like 17 years old and I was just so like feeling, you know that first heartbreak moment where you're just feeling this flood of, you had no idea that it's like you got cold cocked, like you had no idea your defenses were down from this side and you're totally winded and you're like, how do I express these blues? And uh, that's when I started writing songs and I, uh, I just kind of went from there. Like I started kind of messing around, but then uh, then another breakup came. It was all breakups actually that got me started. And I was uh, supposed to like move to New York to like try to live with my girlfriend at the time. My girlfriend was like, I kind of don't want you to come. <laughs> okay, awesome. fuck you, girlfriend. And that's kind of how it really got started. And, uh, and that's your number one hit. Fuck you, girlfriend <laughs> is uh, yeah. CeeLo's pretty awesome. Though. Um. And yeah, so I started like, it, it really be, began as this weird actor's vanity project, like, like I know how to, like I love, uh, like at that, at the time I started actually, like I, my band was originally called Yonder, and I was really into like alt country, like Ryan Adams and Whiskey Town, and, and obviously Wilco and Jeff Tweedy and all that, and Yonder was the name. Now, of course, when it came time to actually, we made an album, and then we got this record label was interested in us. Uh, we had to change our name because there were like five bands named Yonder. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's like especially some kind of. I, like I remember that demo too. You dropped, yeah, yeah, you dropped that off back at Ten Saint Mary's. Like, hey, take a listen. I made music, motherfucker. <sighs> so I remember. Uh, I think I still have it. <laughs> that was our Jesus Freaks. Uh, uh, three song EP. <laughs> um, and then yeah, we changed to Ten Star Orphans, and that was still like like. The album that's out right now is way more of an album of a band collaboration, but still it's me kind of being the front man. And I've done, I'm sorry, I'm very excited because right now we're, we're about to start recording our, our, our truest album, like the, the ultimate album where the whole band is... The penultimate has, first album? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah exactly. We, uh, we, uh, we all collaborated in this, so it's, it's like... Where are you recording? Um, Dean Marino is our is my uh, the the lead guitarist of the band, and Dean had Chemical Sound for many mm-hmm. years, yeah. and they've just actually decided to uh, go 
and let it go, so they sold it. Um, and Dean kept a smaller kind of studio space, which actually, coincidentally, is right under where the chemical sound was. Uh, so he's got a little space. Shit, I wish I remembered the name of it. I could plug it, I don't remember. But uh, that's where we're gonna do it. So cool. Dean's been, he's basically, we're, we're doing it all on our own. We are no longer with a label. Mm -hmm. We decided that was a nightmare. Uh, so we're, we're totally on our own now and we're just gonna make the album step by step. You know, it's 12 songs, I think, 10 or 12 songs. And, and then slowly just leak it out there. I think that's the best way to go. That's good. Like stream it and then, I think like put a donate button on the stream, you know, like Absolutely. if you want to own this on vinyl or you want the MB3, donate and help us get it made. And, and, well, crowdfunding works that way too. I mean, you can do it <laughs> in Indiegogo campaign too and, or Kickstarter and, mm. you know, offering, you know, it's like, hey, you can get a, you know, a free copy or you can pay for it. It's not even free because if you're donating money towards the, the end result of an album yeah. and you need funds for it, then, you know, it's like, hey, I'm going to raise $10,000 and, you know, for a $25 donation you get, you know, the album on MP3 kind of thing. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you get your, yeah, I think that's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing how far... Jeez, thanks, guys. Now I know where to go. <laughs> Did you catch that? Did you switch it over? Uh, yeah, I was right on it. Oh, good, good, good. good. So, so, uh... No, let's put the actor here. Give him a camera and wait. Go. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, what? Uh, so, I mean, this you know, people are going to be watching this. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, do you have any gigs coming up in January? Uh, yes, we. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we. Uh, Tell yourself, man. We're playing. The sh I'm doing a solo show where I'm performing with with uh, lovely guys, Luke Crydemude from Boys Who Say No. Tell, tell everybody what it's called. J M McNabb from Vista Vision. Tim Moxham from the Great Bloomers. Would you like to know what it's called? Yeah, what's the night called? Let me tell you what the night's called. Well, first I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> it's December 30th, which is a Sunday. Doors at eight, show at nine. The show is called Fuck New Year's. We what's don't, the venue? The, uh, the Rivoli. Very good. It's a nice room. 334 Queen Street West in the back room. It's pay what you can, so it, they're really, you, if you can't, you can still come in. Oh yeah. And you can hear awesome music. Yeah, you do get uh, some looks of disapproval, but you still are allowed in the room. Like, it's like, like uh, what can you pay? I, I can't pay anything. Uh -huh. Well, yeah. you suck, but come on in. Anyway. Yeah, fuck you. Come yeah. on in. Yeah. Fuck, fuck New Year's, fuck you. Fuck you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's the guy. <laughs> I hate New Year's. Like, I've, I've always hated New Year's. I do not like going out. Uh, I... I like last year we did this like quiet like we just moved into a house uh my wife and i and uh and we had like a couple friends over you know but that was it i can't stand new year's so fuck new year's this is our third annual one it's usually the whole band playing but it's a way of let's have a big show and enjoy ourselves the night before and then go home and chill out for the rest of the day nice mm. no um, expectations I know we're playing canadian music fest this year i have not been told where yet but that is in march and I know that we will be opening for the Strumbellas at the Dakota Tavern in Toronto at some, on some Tuesday in January. I haven't uh, confirmed when. Terrific. You should. Uh, I will be at the Dakota Tavern on yes! January the 18th with the band Hot Wax Meltdown. It's a party time. Come on down. I will. Talented people. Dakota is such a great place because the stage is this high off the ground. It's like the audience and the band are one. It is brilliant. You know what's yeah, great? The smartest what? basement bar ever. Your, your mouth cop there. Oh, yeah? There we go. Look at that. What were you saying about your amazing I was just <laughs> Now, hold on. Saying Let me help you out with that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and if we could just yeah, add... Yeah, could you superimpose a little... <laughs> I'm coming out of the... <laughs> is that, did you just fart its way out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there was so much pressure... <laughs> plugging, plugging some shows, and unplugging the microphone. You're just going right back to me before we got weird. Yeah, sure. I'm plugging shows. Uh, and I'm in a show coming out. What are you doing? Uh, I did the Jack, the Jack Layton story. Uh, story. It was called Smiling Jack. Right. I don't know. That if was the original list. script. Yeah. Uh, I think they might change that. Or, or not, I have no idea, but... Uh, who do you portray in the life story of Jack Lee? I play Brad Levine, who was the campaign manager. I got to meet Brad, he's an awesome guy. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so that's who plays that's, Jack Layton then. Uh, Rick Roberts plays Jack. He's terrific. Like I, they, if you, I've seen like the, put a mustache on that guy and he's Jack Layton. Yeah, he's, okay. he's, no, he's, he's got, got like piece to make him. You know, you know. Well, guys, they went through two. Uh, he did at least two hours. Uh, I think it was three hours before every scene. Oh, like okay. it was it, it, his commitment to the character was insane. Amazing. Like, uh, Rick's been a friend of mine for a while now, and 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 I love to do this. I, we we became really good friends doing this because of. Having to really band together it was uh, an amazing cast. Sook and Lee uh, plays Olivia Chow, and she's outstanding. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's it's. I think it's going to be a really, uh, a really cool, uh, cool piece of work. So I'm looking forward to. It. You know? Do you I, know? Uh, do you know their their intended air dates or? I don't. I, I've heard March. What March on CBC? Um, Who directed sure. it? Uh, Jeff Wolno. Mm-hmm. And uh, Laszlo Barna was the uh, the producer there, and they're amazing. Everyone's just awesome. It was really a, a really fun experience, and and I'm I'm just you know what's funny about that? I'll tell you something really quick about that. I was the uh, I was like I wanted that role. I'm sure I'm sure like ten of us at least in this town, <laughs> probably more. Uh, I, want, I was but, a diehard NDP. I mean, I don't understand how you got that role and not me. I can't. I voted I, for. Let me tell you what I was. What I like, literally had finished the week of the audition was The West Wing. I had watched the entire series, and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm going so Josh Lyman, Sam Seaborn on this guy. It's unbelievable. Let's go." And so the, I, I don't know if that's what got me the job. But was, <laughs> it was so exciting to like finish this show that you're totally glued to, and then your next audition is. Come here and be the campaign manager for some. Wow, sure. But it was amazing. And, and actually, Olivia Chow is uh, uh, totally part of it. And she, she donated a lot of Jack's like stuff, like his cane. And so we had actual props that Jack used and stuff. So it was, and, and Rick, wow. It was, uh, it was a master class uh, working with him on that. It really cool. was. He was a, nothing but patient and accommodating with every single person from, from the, the driver who picked him up to... You know, an extra who wanted a picture with him or anything. Mm-hmm. He was just he was constantly giving on every level, and that yeah, was awesome. It was inspiring. Like Jack, like Jack. There you go. Exactly. He did him proud for sure. It was pretty amazing. Well, I think that's. Uh, can I end this now? Yeah. Now you can end it. Cock. Uh, I'm James Scott. Uh, I'm I should have looked Goldberg. in the camera. I'm not an actor, so I'm I don't know how to look I'm in the camera. Brian. I'm James Scott. I am Brian Gold. And our guest today was Zachary Bennett. Yeah. Cast yeah. this. Thanks Cast a, this. Thanks a lot, Zach. Cheers. Thank you very fun. much for joining us. I'd shake your hand from over here. We had longer uh, arms. Uh, I have long <laughs> arms. I have the long arm of my law. The, <laughs> of your in-laws. Of my in-laws. Yeah, I love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> In today's world, people are busy and impatient. We are on information overload. Every minute counts. People want to know what you can do for them. They won't spend time reading or searching, but they will watch a video. If it clearly explains who you are and what you do and tells them what they want to hear, they will reach out to you. You have seconds to get people's attention. You want a video that is engaging and makes the viewer feel as though it is speaking directly to their needs. Add to your sales team a short video and let it do the heavy selling for you. Or add to your social media or wherever your audience is spending their time. Videos can pay back your investment 10 times over. So now that you've heard our message, let's talk about yours. Let's bring your image to life.